So let me, let's me let turn to our time in the Word of God today. we uh, big surprise, we continue on this conversation from here to there and back again. I think this is week 15. Are you getting tired of it? No. Oh, good, because I am. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm not getting tired. <laughs> so um, we just to bring people up uh, to speed in where we've been in this, I, you know, there's, there's a sense of um, the, the, we track through Jesus's timeline uh, and uh, we're doing this kind of an angle, this mindset of from here to there. So from A to B and back to A. So, you know, we use, for example, the resurrection where Jesus was living here on earth. A went through death B, but then came back to life A. And that's been we track that all the way through Jesus's life here on earth. And then after the planet, sometimes we forget Jesus is active. He is our high priest now. He is interceding in prayer right now. He, he, he has the power power to give life. And so there are many things that Christ is about. And then he's coming back. We looked at that. And in these uh, these few weeks that are we're going to finish this out, I really thought, let's do something uh, that from a practical point of view and, and uh, some things in our lives that I think are important. Today, we talk about something that is extremely difficult for human beings. It's just for whatever reason, there's a lot of different reasons why this is true. But it is it is the area of feedback so you're, you're doing something, you're living your life from A to B, and then somebody's going to give you, you're going to come back again and give you feedback. So maybe that's, you know, on the job. So you're, you paint the fence. And so you, you know, from A to B, the, the A is the fence is unpainted. B, the fence is finished painting. And then somebody's going to come along and say, hey, let me tell you, give you some feedback, some evaluation. We have had that evaluation, this feedback since we've been kids, right? I mean, even before you went to school, you're getting feedback like, hey, you know, eat with a spoon up and not down. So it doesn't go down, you know, and uh, my wife just told me that last night. So I, uh, and so, uh, you know, as we're learning all the time, then you get in school or you're homeschooling or whatever your environment is and there's grading, there's assessment. You take a test, A to B, and then somebody says, hey, you didn't get an A or B, uh, you know, whatever that is, that evaluation, there's that feedback. So today it's, uh, I w there's, a, there's a sense of the value of the feedback, but also I think the, the Bible says a lot about receiving counsel receiving uh, input from others. And I believe so strongly in this that it is that if we miss it, and, I, and I'm afraid to say sometimes we do, then we will be swimming in perilous waters. Speaking of perilous waters, we're going to use an example of one of the most historic epic tragedies in American history. And that was the story of, and that's the uh, experience of the Titanic. There are many things that that went wrong with the Titanic when you now, you know, wisdom, uh, hindsight is wisdom. But, you know, there are many things with the Titanic that they they look back. They didn't have enough lifeboats because they were so confident in the boat. They were so con they could have maneuvered in different ways around the icebergs. They couldn't see the icebergs. I don't know if you know the story, but, you know, the guy that had the key to the cabinet with the binoculars got switched out at the last minute to another ship and he forgot to turn in the key. So they didn't have a key to the cabinet that had the binoculars, so they couldn't retrieve the binoculars. So they said, oh, what the heck, let's just do it, you know, by natural eye in the dark. But above all these things, the lifeboats, the binoculars, the overconfidence in the, in the structure of the ship, beyond all of those things, maybe one of the most perilous mistakes they made was to disregard warnings, to disregard uh, uh, input. We have some uh, excerpts from a study from Britannica, and let me just read some of them to you. Throughout much of the voyage, the wireless radio operators of the Titanic, Jack Phillips and Harold Bride, had been receiving iceberg warnings, most of which, but not all, most of which were passed along to the bridge. The two men worked with the Marconi Company, and most of their job was spent relaying 
passengers' messages. In other words, the yours, the, you got these warnings coming in, you know, icebergs and the place, you know, is f- full of icebergs all around. And so, the, but they were receive, they were more busy with, hey, Mr. Smith, just want to let you know, you know, your sister uh, messaged you and she's a big, and most of the clientele here on the ship were, they were able to afford the, the being on the Titanic. And so when you look at this, you think, wow, man, if, we're, if we are sailing in our life from A to B, and these warnings are com- coming to us, we must understand that no life, no ship goes from A to B, from here to there, in a straight line. Your, your life hasn't gone in a straight line. My life hasn't gone in a straight line. There are icebergs everywhere we live. So there are times where that's a physical ailment. Sometimes it's an unexpected job change. Sometimes it's something that uh, happens in a relationship. There's something that happens to your house. There's something, I mean, there are all, there are icebergs all around us. There's sometimes that there are personality things within us. There are certain things that God is trying to chisel and trying to form into the the body of Christ. And sometimes those things are the greatest icebergs we have because you can't see but a teeny bit of an iceberg. When the Titanic, get this, when the Titanic hit an iceberg, most people didn't feel the impact. It wasn't like, you know, all the plates fell off the, the, the shelves. Most people didn't realize it. And I propose to you that most people don't know their iceberg blind spots. They don't, they don't, you know, and, and when we don't say, hey, let's look at them in a solid way and get some advice and feedback, then we swim in our own peril. There's more to an iceberg, Britannica writes, than meets the eye. Watch this. 90%, nine-tenths of an iceberg is hidden below the surface of the water. Many passengers on the Titanic didn't even realize or notice the impact that was going to be made. We believe in discipleship, if you haven't noticed. (laughs) I would say to you what I fight against and my trainings yesterday, I'm, I'm at ABWE this coming week and my trainings I'm constantly doing, I, you know, I'm the guy that wrote these books and I say, it's not the books. Discipleship is not the books. The books are helpful. They're a key. But discipleship is not, please, I beg people, it is not about getting more information. You can get more information anywhere. A great part of disciple making is feedback. When you look at the life of Jesus and his interaction with the disciples, it wasn't like, hey, let me, he, he gave some information. Here's what's going to happen in the end times. Here's what's going to happen. They're going to crucify me. I'm going to come back from the dead three days from now. So he was definitely giving information. But one of the things he wasn't doing is just, you know, dispersing more content. He would course correct them. What are you guys talking about? He knew what they were talking about. They were they were fussing over something, right? Well, what are you talking about? Oh no, Matt, it's this way. It's not this way. You've heard me say this, but uh, you've heard it said this, but now I'm t- telling you, no, it's this way. Lots of feedback. We were reminded today in Proverbs chapter one and verse five: a wise man will hear and increase in learning. A disciple is a learner. That's the translation. A disciple is a learner, but not, again, just learning over feedback. I would say that if you are not pliable to feedback, you have 0% possibility of growing not only as a person, but as a Christ follower. Do you mind if I repeat that? If you are averse to feedback... And sometimes even that's a blind spot. Most of us say, yeah, I'm I'm open to feedback. But if anybody ever tells you something you don't like, how come you fly off the handle? Or how come you cancel them? Or what, you know what I mean? If you, you know, my job as a pastor is to give them feedback a lot. And I've got to tell you that, you know, the old, the old recepto meter is not high most of the time because, you know, feedback like, hey, I love your shirt. Okay, well, that's, we're not talking about that kind of feedback. (laughs) The feedback we're talking is like, man, it seems like you get angry really easily. Can we can we talk about that? What do you mean I get angry? Well, that's what I'm that's kind of what I'm talking about. 
You see, these are the, the icebergs are the areas that we don't know about. And on the Titanic, they couldn't see it for themselves, the iceberg for themselves, so they needed an outside voice. That's why we call them blind spots. So in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, it's a key word, a key passage. Watch. Speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up. So let me just stop. In that formula, if someone doesn't have the courage and the humility to speak something in love that's truthful in the beginning, most likely we will only grow up in some things and not all things. We should thank the people who have the courage enough to give us input. Do we always have to agree with it? Absolutely not. But I say, man, create some runway like, hey, let me think about that before you, you know, maybe dismiss it. Speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up to in, uh, into him who is the head, that is Jesus Christ. Now, when the Titanic, when the, the, the warnings came into the Titanic, watch their, uh, their uh, response to this. Captain Smith, he was a seasoned captain, by the way. Uh, he's, by all measure, he was a great man. Uh, he, but he, he'd actually gone to bed uh, when the, he, was, uh, he was in the sack when the, the Titanic, because he thought, hey, we got this big boat, pretty confident. I asked, hey, call me if there's any problem. And I'm hitting hay. And so, you know, but he then started getting warnings. Captain Smith, watch, slightly altered the ship's course to head farther south. However, he maintained the ship's speed of some 22 knots. And I don't, you don't know that language neither, but it, he just kept the same speed. He should have slowed way down the ships. There were other ships in the area. Those were the ones that were giving warnings to him. They completely stopped their boat. They stopped their ship. But because of the overconfidence, he kept plowing ahead and only slightly altered the course. Listen, when Christ brings something to our lives, a slight alteration in it won't get the job done. And the challenge for us as human beings is slowing down is hard. Stopping is hard. Like, let me just stop and think about that. In fact, let me get away from the whole rat race of this of life. And let me just ponder something. If it's serious enough, let me ponder something. Is it, and maybe my relationship with Christ is apathetic. Maybe I pick on people. Maybe I'm too detailed. Maybe I'm a perfectionist and there's nothing wrong with a perfectionist. I'm pro perfectionist. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm looking at my perfectionist friend over here. So, you know, there are those things. I'm, I'm going to just be personal here. I remember, I will never forget the conversation that, uh, that, uh, at the time, Brent was one of our elders. He said, hey, wanna, he's a home builder. And he said, I want you to come over to my home. And uh, I'm like, okay, I'll take a look at your home. It's a beautiful home. And, and uh, we sat uh, out in the, the porch, you remember? And uh, he said, do you see, see this home? And it was just, you know, it hadn't been lived in yet. And uh, we were looking at the, I just thought we were having a good time. And uh, apparently we weren't. <laughs> He gently, lovingly said, you know, Steve, um, I'm a perfectionist, and I can see that you are too. And you're going to have to watch that. You have to be careful that you don't put that on others or that it drives you crazy or makes you work so hard. I'll never forget that. And it took, you know, some time to just digest that and say, you know what? You got to let some things go. So I'm saying that to you, being personally vulnerable to you, because as I've always said, you know, you just saved me a hundred bucks in counseling. So I just got it right off my chest. I feel much better about that. I'm saying that because all of us have these things. And trust me, that is something that if you imagine, I took 25 years of piano lessons to practice over and 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 over to get it perfect. Do not get the, 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 and having input, input, input. You're playing too fast. You're playing too slow. Your pedaling's off. You missed that F sharp, blah, blah, blah. It's all about perfection. As a concert pianist, you go out and you miss a note. Like, ooh, you missed the F sharp. It's a big deal, right? <laughs> and so this is something in my life. What is it in your life? 
and maybe most likely you don't see it you are you need an outside radio voice to come in and say iceberg ahead there's something that you can't see nine tenths of all right so we're going to jump into the story let me try to to tell you the figures that the, the are key players in this story, okay? There's a Jeroboam and a Rehoboam. There's a prophet called Ahijah, not Elijah, just so that you just want to pre prep you to be conf totally confused by the story, all right? Jeroboam was a man that lived in uh, Solomon's day. In fact, he was kind of a a general contractor, because in, in Solomon's day, of course, one of the major tasks was built to build this opulent palace, this temple for the, the worship of God. And sometimes we look at it, it's so easy to read that stuff. It was a massive, massive project. Now, Jeroboam was appointed as to be kind of, as I said, a general contractor over this labor force and most likely forced labor. It's obvious when you read the entire story that Solomon wasn't the easiest guy to get along with. Uh, he started passionately with God, but as we'll see, he veered off the road severely. But in the, in the process of reading this story, he must have been extremely hard on his workers. Along the way, this prophet, Ahijah, came to Jeroboam, and then um, as, um, as Solomon began to drift away from God, he had uh, 700 wives. I'm just trying to wrap my head around that. <laughs> I don't even know how that works. <laughs> I'd have to see. Yeah, it's expensive, I guess. Right. But I mean, uh, 700 wives, 300 concubines. Just think about that. I mean, I don't know. Do you have like tea with one of them every two years or something? I don't know. I don't, at any rate, it doesn't matter, but... But he stepped over a line, and that line, it, it, the minute we step over the line, it begins to shift. And the Titanic, you know, it doesn't move on a dime. It just shifts a little at a time. And the cardinal rule that he, that he broke here was that he, be, he married these women that had no relationship with God at all. In fact, they had relationships with other imaginary gods. And they drew his heart away, okay? The prophet Ahijah comes to Jeroboam, and he takes his robe, he takes it off, and he rips the robe in 12 pieces, representing the 12 units of Israel, or the tribes of Israel. He gives to uh, uh, Jeroboam 10 pieces of the robe, and he said, you will be over 10 of the tribes, and because of Solomon's heart, I'm going to split the kingdom of Israel, the, the nation of Israel. From that point on, everything in the book of Kings, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, everything in the Chronicles, from that point on, because the story's kind of duplicated, from that point on, there's northern Israel, 10 tribes, and there's southern Judah, right? Now you think, okay, I thought 10 plus 1 equal 11. They combined Benjamin and Judah. And some of you are like, okay, I don't even know what the heck you're talking about. But so uh, God said, I'm preserving Judah because that's, was, that's where David, the city of David, and because I love David so much, I'm preserving that. Otherwise, God would probably give the whole thing to Jeroboam, okay? All right. So when you come to this intersection in history, here's the thing, okay? Jeroboam was given this 10 of the, of the tribes of Israel ahead of time. And Solomon got wind of that. That's where we kind of begin to say, hey, Solomon wasn't all that nice of a guy. And he put a hit on Jeroboam. In other words, he said, I, I want him killed, and he put a hit on him. Jeroboam heard this, and he ran to Egypt. It seemed to be the runaway place in the Bible. He ran to Egypt, okay? Now Solomon dies. Solomon's son is Rehoboam, okay? So you got Jeroboam in Egypt and Rehoboam, Solomon's son. Rehoboam is now the new, fresh leader. So Jeroboam thinks, hmm, maybe this is a time where I come back and try to offer an olive branch and say, hey, can we move forward? Are you tracking with me? I know it's a lot of detail. For 2 Chronicles chapter 10, we pick up the story, and this is where we're going to plan. 
Rehoboam went to Shechem. Remember, we talked about Shechem and the importance of it last week, if you were here. For all the Israelites had gone to make Rehoboam king. When Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard this, he was in Egypt where he fled from King Solomon, he returned from Egypt. So they sent for Jeroboam, and he and all Israel went to Rehoboam and said to him, so Jeroboam you know, fled to Egypt, comes back, he says, hey, your dad was pretty heavy. Your dad, your father put a heavy yoke on us. But now I'm giving you some advice because I've been out here with all the contractors. I've been out here with all the stone carvers. I've been out here with the bricklayers. And I'm telling you, it was too heavy. I'm trying, you may not have known that. This might be an iceberg for you, but I'm telling you, it doesn't look good if you don't, you're going to crash the boat if you don't take this advice. Your dad put, he, he uh, put a heavy yoke on us. And so he said, if, but now, if you lighten the harsh labor, that means there was harsh labor. So you kind of read between the lines. If you lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us, we will serve you. These people will love you. So Rehoboam said, okay, come back to me in three days. So the people went away. Then King Roab, Ro, uh, Ro, uh, Rehoboam went and consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. And listen, had a valued voice because they had seen how Solomon had treated the people. So this was the perfect place to go to these elders who had walked and lived with Solomon. How would you advise me to answer these people? And they replied, if you will be kind to these people and please them and give them a favorable answer, they will love you and they will serve you and they'll be on your side. And it was an amazing piece of advice. However, when you look at this uh, this advice, sometimes we think we're right in our own eyes. The challenge sometimes is when we ask for advice, we're really asking for affirmation of what we already want. Have you ever done that? Sometimes I've heard people say, well, God asked me to win the lotto. No, he didn't. <laughs> you wanted to, right? What, that's a silly example, but, uh, but it wouldn't be a bad thing. No, just kidding. It's it, this, these are the things that we're saying, I want you to shoot straight with me, regardless if I like the answer or not. Am I too harsh? Am I too quick to, to judge? Am I, whatever those questions are, make sure we're not just saying, we're not asking for people to say, oh, no, 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 you being harsh. Oh, that's not the case. That's not what was happening here. The fool, Proverbs 12 tells us, the way of a fool is always right in his own eyes. But a wise man listens to counsel even if it's not what he wants. So watch what happens uh, in Second Chronicles 10 verse 8. Rehoboam then rejected the advice of the elders that he gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and were serving him. He went to his friends. He kind of already knew what they were going to say. He asked them, hey, what's your advice? How should we answer these people who say to me, lighten the yoke of your father put on us? The young men who had grown up with him replied, tell the people who have said your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our light yoke. Tell them this, that my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid on you a heavier yoke, a heavy yoke. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I'll scourge you with scorpions. Pretty bad political consultant. And that's exactly what he did. He took that advice. He gave to them this. He went to the people. He laid it on them. I mean, as we're going to see, man, he refused to listen to good advice. And it was perilous. It was the end of his kingdom. It was the end of the reign. But more than that, it was the end of the mission that God had given him to oversee the entire nation of Israel. There had been a lot of work to get to that place to, uh, uh, for the kingdom of God. In the Titanic at 10.55 p.m., the thing sunk about 2.30 in the morning. At 10.55 p.m., the nearby Leyland Liner, California, and it was a ship, 
sent word that it had actually stopped completely because it was sound, surrounded by ice. Captain Phillips, who was handling the uh, uh, Phillips, who was handling the passengers' messages, scolded the Californian ship and said, "You're interrupting me. Think about it. I will I will propose to you." That any advice that we get that we don't like will always feel like an interruption. Because we're going from here to there, we're moving to here to there, and like, and all of a sudden, if we make any change in our life, it's gonna be an interruption of our flow from here to there, and that is awful. I hate to be interrupted. I hate that my life where I'm like, oh, I've got to pause, I've got to think about that, I've got to work on that, I've got to. And so this guy, you know, who's handling messages, shut up. In fact, it's part of the, it's part of the uh, court. If you go further in the court, he actually said, shut up. We don't want to hear any more warnings. Think about it. A fool does not delight, Proverbs 18, does not delight in understanding, but only in revealing his own mind. So Britannica tells us the California's electric signal was so close that it nearly deafened Phillips. So there's a quote. Nearly deafens Phillips. In other words, the, the signal came through so clear because the, the, the California ship was so close to the, that the, the sound was so loud. Think about it. Sometimes the advice is so loud. There's an iceberg in your life. <laughs> Shut up, he said. <laughs> Shut up. I am busy. And a while later, the California's radio operator said, fine, and shut down the rest of the night. Among other boats that didn't sink that night, guess one that didn't? The Californian. Sometimes it's irritating, isn't it? But I got to tell you, there are some times when we listen that even though we work through that, it's marvelous. Watch what happens, Second Chronicle chapter 10, verse 16. When all Israel saw that the king refused to listen to them, the entire nation, they answered the king, then what do we have to share? What share do we have in David and what part in Jesse's son? To your tents, O Israel. Look after your own house, O David. So all the Israelites went home. So Israel, from this point, has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. It's a divided house. Now think about it. This little tribe of Judah, where Rehoboam is, they've lost their protection. They've lost their military wall. They've lost their brotherhood. They've lost their united, uh, united uh, front. They've lost their, their unity in ministry. They've lost the light to the rest of the world. They have lost so much. I guess you could say it like this. Their ship got sunk that day. Just because someone said, shut up. I don't want to hear any wise advice. Now it works the other way too, by the way. It works in, in ways that when people give you advice and you take it, not only does your boat not sink, but man, your boat can sail. Everybody knows, probably sitting in this room, if you're online at home, everybody knows the dream speech of Martin Luther King Jr. And what you may know, some of you, is that he was given that speech on there in the in front of the Washington Memorial. The place was, you've seen pictures of it, just pack, pack, pack. And quite frankly, he was boring everybody. And he kept going on with the speech. And this famous singer was behind him. And she was an older woman. And just kind of under her breath, close enough for her, for him to hear. She said, tell him about the dream, Martin. Forget the speech. Forget what you wrote down on that paper. She probably perceived being a performer like, hey, I think people kind of getting, you know, zoned out here. She said, she said, tell him about the dream, Martin. And he put his notes away and delivered one of the most historic, epic, life-changing speeches in American history. I have a dream. No notes. Off script. Because one piece of advice. See, I feel that 
in your life one piece of advice of an iceberg that you may not like, that you can't definitely can't see, that if you were able to take that and say, oh God, what is it? Is this true? Search me, oh God, at the least. Maybe if I could give you one action step, because I know changing an opinion, changing a life, getting feedback, you know, as we've said, tough. But one thing I would say, lengthen your runway to reaction. Lengthen your runway to reaction. Steve, man, you're going to be careful about perfectionism. No, I don't. I could have, could have been that answer, right? Let me think about it. Let me ponder that. Let me go to God and say, search me, O God. Am I this? Am I too harsh? Am I too quick to anger? Am I apathetic? Am I lazy? Am I do everything half-baked? Am I always late? Am I whatever those things are? Am I, am I treating my wife? Am I honoring her? Am I treating my husband? Am I honoring her? Am I walking with God? Is there that thing that I just want to ignore? Or is there something I can't even see? And so the first thing would be lengthen the runway of your reaction and let God verify with God and verify with other people. Say, hey, somebody just told me I'm a, you know, I go home, I tell my wife, hey, somebody said I was a perfectionist. Well, finally, right? That's what your spouse is going to say. Finally, you haven't heard me tell you that 112 times. You know how that works. It's like when have you have a teenager and they say, you know, the student pastor saw that said, I, I should probably clean my room. Like you think that is just a marvelous, innovative idea that we've never said ever. <laughs> Lengthen the runway. Allow time for you to search your heart. Allow time to talk with others so that you really take it seriously. Second thing and final thing. You got to kiss the ground of the people that give you feedback. Whether you agree with them or not, ever how they delivered it to you or not, because we end with this, this passage. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. But deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. If you're surrounded by people that just tell you what you want to hear, you might rethink how you define that friendship. My best friends tell me what I need to hear. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you for this very practical, every single day life message for us. Human beings, for whatever reason, God, we have a sense of resistance for feedback in our lives. And and uh, because of all the things you've laid out, sometimes we just think our way is the right way. And it's, 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 a, difficult, uh, it's a difficult thing to, to feedback. But God, when we look back in our lives, those moments where we were able to receive something and then think about it and modify change course those things some of those things have saved us saved our lives from extreme penalty and and perilous water and from sinking at times and most likely all of us could look back on those times where we disregarded that so today thank you god for your word that teaches us once again that there is value of each other there's value of faithful friends who who are willing to even wound us at times, to wound our hearts, whatever that might be. Above all, God, we need your Holy Spirit in this journey because our whole goal here is to be chiseled and formed more into the image of Christ. And that takes constant learning, not learning only of information, new content, but it also takes learning of, of life. And we can't do it alone. We need others, but we also need your Holy Spirit. So when we have received this, God, we receive this feedback. God, allow us the, the patience. Empower us, God, even with a, a waiting period to, to come before you and say, God, is this, what are you speaking about this? What does your word say? What is your Holy Spirit speaking? And, and verify it. So God, thank you for this. We need these, these moments of practicality in our life. And I 
I just believe, God, that our whole lives would be different. Discipleship would be different if we were to, and that advancing the kingdom would be more impactful if we, especially as Christ followers, learn to amp up our game here and taking feedback. Father, thank you, God, for Jesus Christ, your son. Thank you for sending him to earth. Thank you, Father, that you assessed the world and understood that we were broken and helpless and we couldn't find our way out of sin, that no human being, no book, no religion, no church, nothing could really help us. And so you sent your son. We remind ourselves of this every day, every week, God, when we walk in it. And for some, that's a new concept that you, God, would, would send your son here to earth and much less send him to earth, but to die for other people. Many people have died in wars fighting for a cause. Your son died for the cause of salvation to save us. So as believers in Christ, God, first of all, we thank you. But second of all, we pray right in this moment. I'm inviting those of you that are, or that are Christ followers to pray right in this moment. For those sitting in this room, for those sitting in their, their homes or their cars listening right at this moment. We're all praying for you. Let me tell you why. If you're searching for God, we're praying for you. And the reason we're praying for you is that we have all walked the journey that you've walked. And someone was praying for us not to become a better person, not to become more religious, but to have a living, real relationship with the God who created you and me. And the only way that we can do that is not through the portal of religion or behavior modification, but through the cross of Jesus. And here's why. Because Jesus was the only sinless man who walked the earth. He became God's sent lamb who would die for the sins of the world. We needed someone outside the realm of our human sinful experience. So Jesus was born of a virgin, surpassing the human sinful nature that comes through, through a typical birth human birth. Now that may be complicated for you and it is profound, but here's the simplicity of it. You know, deep down, and this is what we're praying. You know, deep down that you're imperfect. We're imperfect. Everyone's imperfect. And God doesn't wink at that. God doesn't overlook that. He can't because he's perfect and imperfect and perfect in the supernatural spiritual world cannot come together. Therefore, Jesus sent his son to die for you, to take away your sins if you embrace him as your savior and depend on him. See, if you are in the ocean on the Titanic, if you're clinging to a lifeboat, you'll be saved. If you're clinging to a, an anchor, you're gonna be lost. You're gonna be, you're gonna drown. And everything around you, religion and money and capitalism and better trying to be better, those are all anchors. There is one lifeboat and his name is Jesus. And depending on what you're clinging to will depend on whether you live or die. Won't you come to Jesus right now? We're praying that God, as he's revealing that to you, you'd be open to hearing from him. I need a savior. I am imperfect. I'm in broken. I've tried to do better. I've tried to, but why is there still a gap between me and God? That's because you need Jesus Christ to forgive all your sins, to take away all your sins, to wash away all your sins so that unbelievably, miraculously, you can stand before God with confidence, knowing that he's taken away all your sin and that he sees you as absolutely sinless. Wouldn't you want that relationship with God? And wouldn't you want it right now? Why not come to him and pray this simple prayer? Father, I turn my life away from the direction. I change course of my ship. 
And instead of sailing it in my own direction, I turn it around toward you. And I come to you, God, with my life as it is, imperfect and broken. And I'm asking that you forgive all my sin. Father, would you, I'm accepting Christ as you accept me. I depend on Christ. I transfer my life. I exchange my old life, God, for the one, the new one can, that Christ can give. Is that your prayer? Listen, speaking of feedback and advice, this is the wisest advice you'll ever receive. Don't walk your life without God. Don't go another step without God. Be, be open to this advice, not from me, but from God himself. You see what God demonstrated his love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ, his son, died for us. Will you depend on him? Will you pray now? Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you again for your word. Thank you again for this team going to the DR. Thank you again for those who are serving and for, for, for helping meet the need of this truck in Ukraine. Thank you, Father, for all that you've done today. Thank you for hearts that were changing today. Thank you, God, for hearts that were pondering today. Thank you, God, for hearts that were saying to you yes today. Thank you, God, for those who are searching today. God, thank you for our time of worship, the time in the Word. God, we are grateful for you are a great God. And we repeat what we, we sang earlier. Will you fail? You won't. God, will you leave us alone? You won't. For that reason, we close this time by saying, God, we worship you and we need you. In the powerful name of Jesus, amen.